Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and today I'm bringing you another Goosebumps Talk video. And today's subject is going to be the top 10 most unfaithful Goosebumps episode adaptations from the 90s show. Now, being upfront and transparent, there was a lot of liberties taken in the 90s television show to the point where I had so many considerations and I went back and forth on a lot of episodes and it was hard to narrow down 10, let alone five, which I initially wanted to do. But I think for this type of video, it's kind of more educational, in my opinion, to share with you all these episodes because the biggest misconstruence I see in the Goosebumps community out there is that the 90s show was mostly adapting the books faithfully. And that's just not true. If you assume that, uh, Godspeed, I mean, there are a fair share of faithful adaptations in the show, but most of the time, if there was liberties to be taken, the show took them. <laughs> and these are the ones that I think took the most liberties, uh, whether we're talking adding characters, changing narratives of the story, changing the plot, merging book plots together, completely scrapping a plot and making something brand new, whatever the case may be, I think these episodes are the most unrecognizable to their source material counterparts. And I'm going to be up front. A lot of you are probably expecting that I'm including more Monster Blood in here uh, in terms of me referring that to Monster Blood 2. I will not be including more Monster Blood in this video because it was written from scratch for the show. Yes, it is based on a chapter for Monster Blood 2, but since it's not titled Monster Blood 2 and not an overt adaptation or labeled as one, we're not going to be covering it here. And you might be upset that I'm including one episode that is kind of in the similar boat, but because it was titled a certain way, we can include it. So, with that being said, I have 10 here. I have no honorable mentions. Uh, so, before we go into anything else, let me know down in the comments section, what episodes do you think are the least faithful? And after you're done watching this video, let me know if you think I missed a few that could be in consideration. Because like I said, I went through all of them and I probably deliberated all the ones you're going to talk about. So, without the way, let's start off with number 10. And at number 10, this one was more splitting hairs. Same thing with number 9. I think there was 8 clear choices that feel the most separated from the source material. But I have here a pick that I think is pretty reasonable. And the pick is Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes that is included on this Go Eat Worms DVD along with Go Eat Worms Bad Hair Day and uh, the episode itself. So, yeah, Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes. The reason why I included it in this video and for this list is for simple reasons. Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes, the episode, takes a lot of liberties with the source material, even though you do have the same basis of plot going on. The idea is the main character Joe and his sister and his family are at odds with their neighbor Major McCall and there is a gardening competition between Major McCall and Joe's father. However, the similarities kind of in there uh, in the story because in the episode the lawn gnomes Hap and Chip, they kind of operate similarly to the book but as the story goes along, you see plenty of changes that the, the show writers wanted to change up from the book that stand out. Especially how the lawn gnomes operate and what can possibly turn them on and off. Uh, and kind of like how they behave as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot different than the book. Uh, there's some certain scenes changed up that are similar, of course. But uh, at the end result, once you get to the back half of the episode, you're going to see most of the changes, specifically regarding uh, Major McCall, what happens to him, and especially the ending and the context of it all is completely changed as well. Uh, none of that stuff happened in the book. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, this is a hard one to place here because some episodes feel close to this one, but I think that this one qualifies enough to put it here. So that's why it's here at number 10. 
And number nine, we're going to be using the same disc here because there's another episode on this disc that I think is not all that faithful. Even though I've never read the book, I know enough about the story and what this episode kind of omits from it and changes from it that I know that it's not that faithful. And it's Bad Hair Day. Bad Hair Day is number nine. And here's the thing. The whole setup, kind of like Revenge of the Law Gnomes, is the same. The main character, Tim, he idolizes this magician named Amazo. And once he learns that this guy Amazo is kind of a jerk to him, he decides to steal uh, his bag of tricks, let's just say. But uh, let's just say it backfires on him. That's pretty much the only similarity <laughs> from the book to the episode here. Minus a few small scenes that are reminiscent to the book. There's a whole new character in the episode called L. Sidney that replaces another character named Frank in the book that I know of that's supposed to be the, the, the begrudged sorcerer that uh, did a 180 on Amazo, let's just say. But in here, the, the whole context with Amazo has changed up and it's now L. Sidney is trapped in these uh, magic kits of sorts that belong to Ma Amazo. And there's some a lot of characters omitted uh, from the book to this episode um, counterpart here, down to El Sidney's preparations and plans uh, in the story and how Tim is handled in the story, down to the climax and the ending. It's completely unrecognizable to the book. So that's why it's here. Um, you could probably make an argument that, you know, it's not that bad kind of like Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes or some other episodes that also kind of fit it but it was splitting hairs first the number 10 and number 9 spot and that's why I put Bad Hair Day here I just feel like uh, it had a lot more reason to be on here um, more than Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes but it's still close so there you go at number eight, this is going to come to no shock to anybody, especially if you are a book and episode fan and you've been in many conversations with people about this specific story. But at number eight, we have Night of the Living Dummy 3. <laughs> yes, this episode, uh, I know my boy uh, BD and I and, uh, and a good friend of mine, Bruce, we did a collab talking about uh, the most confused episodes with their book counterparts, whatever. And this was on there because there's so many changes in this episode that I think people prefer over the book that it stands out for that reason. Now, Night of the Living Dummy 3, you might not be able to recognize immediately the differences here because I would say from the beginning of the story all the way up to the point where the kids kind of bond or possibly even throw Slappy down the well, um, it's kind of similar. You know, you still have the, the same plot with the two main characters, Trina and Dan. Uh, they have this history with their cousin Zeke that's coming to visit. Their dad's a ventriloquist enthusiast. He picks up Slappy, repairs him. Uh, they read a spell. Slappy is activated early on in the story, but Slappy was never doing all these pranks on them. It was actually Zeke getting revenge for what happened uh, in events that transpired before the story. So that's all still there. But in the episode... Once that stuff is over, it's completely different from the book counterpart. The first thing uh, that it does differently is that all the dummies that are on this cover here that were used on Night of the Living Dummy 3's book that were barely in the book except in one paragraph in the climax, they're actually brought to life. And this is the episode where we get to see Rocky, you know, front and center. We get to see Slappy utilize a very unique ability that was introduced in this episode and it completely changes the back half of the story where Slappy, of course, uh, turns a certain kid into a dummy and all these other dummies are helping him and the climax is handled a bit different and we see a whole different scenario play out with how Slappy's defeated and even the ending is completely changed there. So this is an episode that uh, kind of fits in this middle ground of the list where it has some of the skeleton of the book, but it takes a lot of liberties to the point where it's unrecognizable in the result. So that's why it's here. At number seven, um, this definitely fits in with Night of the Living Dummy 3's trend. We have One Day at Horrorland. Now, One Day at Horrorland is an easy pick for this type of list because everybody knows this by now, how controversial this episode is. Part one it's more so the, the iconic book 16 from the original 62, 
minus the fact that another character is cut out for budgetary reasons. But it plays out similarly, where the Morris family, they're looking for a vacation, they stumble across Horrorland, they go inside, and they start to experience rides and attractions that are out of this world and kind of dangerous. And that's essentially part one, until they get to the game show part, which is kind of touched on in the book, but in the episode in part two, it completely changes that that part of the book onward to a whole new thing. And it kind of merges the ending of the book, or I guess uh, the twist to the book with the characters and the realization they come to how to handle the horrors. That's kind of added on in here. But part two is complete liberties being taken. It's a whole game show meta thing. <laughs> Uh, and it's unrecognizable to the book. I mean, down from the humor, the dialogue, what actually happens, uh, none of that happens in the book. Uh, all the way through the climax, the ending itself, it's it's unrecognizable uh, to the point where it's obvious it's going to be on here. So that's number seven. Now, at number six, um, some people might be shocked this one is this low. Uh it, it still fits in with the other two I just mentioned, where it has mostly a, a similar skeleton, but it starts to veer off into its own thing. And we have Don't Go to, Don't Go to Sleep, which is featured on this Scarecrow Walks at Midnight DVD, along with the Scarecrow Walks at Midnight and Calling All Creeps. So Don't Go to Sleep, uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of similar, right? And I feel bad for putting this one this high because the story in a nutshell, is kind of the same idea. It's about this kid named Matt. Um, he's having trouble at home. He kind of wishes that uh, the reality he lives in uh, was different, and he goes up to a specific part of the house. In this episode, it's the attic in the uh, in the book. I think it's a guest room where, you know, he falls asleep, and then he starts to go into this reality warping thing, and every time he wakes up, he falls back asleep into a new reality, and it, it, that's the book, right? But the episode here takes a different approach, where uh, as soon as he falls asleep, he starts, you know, of course, going into the realities. But the, everything about the realities that were in the book is tweaked here, almost unrecognizable. There's no real congruent scenes. But there are two characters that are in the book, the reality police, that are played up way higher and there's even a whole thing near the end of the episode that's completely new, and that plays into the ending that's completely new as well, where they take this angle of the reality of the universe, you know, like court or something, and he's kind of taken there, and none of that stuff was in the book, and the reality police are definitely played up to be more uh, prominent characters in the story, and the ending is pretty different, I would say, um, compared to the book, um... And that even involves the context of it. So, Don't Go to Sleep is almost unrecognizable to the book. Um, and, and I know a lot of people tend to tend to say that they might prefer this over the book just for being crazy and outright just out there uh, indifferent compared to it. So, that's why it's here on the list at number six. Now, now my top five, in my opinion, are the most unrecognizable to the source material um, but my number five and my number four still have that it kind of feels on the same plot, right? They're not taking everything and just throwing it away. There is some similarities here. And at number five, we have Cry of the Cat. I know some people might be upset with how high I placed this one, but Cry of the Cat, in all, in all sense of the word, is <laughs> in almost in name only, but it still has the same idea about this girl named Crystal. She's either a thespian in the book or an actress on a show in the episode. Uh, she is preparing for a part, but she stumbles across a cat that might have a curse. And this might be tied to a family of a little girl named Crystal and some animal experimentation and all of that. And it might involve her mom in the climax. Uh, that's pretty much the only similarities here. Everything else involving how Rip operates the things that you see Rip do compared to the book is absolutely different. Um, even the tone of the episode is all meta. It's a show within a show type of thing. And the showrunners are trying to uh, poke fun at themselves a little bit. And everything is, takes place on a movie set 
rather than a play. Even the characters kind of feel different from their book counterparts. Um, and the look of Rip is even different. I don't know if that was budgetary reasons or what, uh, but they took a lot of liberties with this. And uh, there's plenty of differences to poke at. Even the ending uh, is pretty different. The only thing that feels identical to the book kind of is the climax. But even then, they add the secondary character, Ryan, into the episode to actually make him a character in that. So there's still a lot of changes going on here. And it's almost unrecognizable to its book counterpart. So that's why it's here at number five. All right. Now we're entering top four, and these are the spiciest ones, I think. A lot of people know this one. It's going to come to no shock that it's on here, but at number four, we have The Haunted Mask 2. The Haunted Mask 2, by almost every stretch, is only in concept similar to its book counterpart. Uh, the concept of it is that Steve, who was a bully of the former Haunted Mask 1 protagonist, Carly Beth, the year prior on Halloween wants to acquire a mask. Uh, in the book, he wants revenge on these uh, elementary school kids that he's forced to coach uh, soccer for, for hurting his leg and pretty much breaking it. As in the episode, his motive to get a mask is because it's his one last Halloween. He wants to have a final night to scare people before he gets too old. And pretty much down... Uh, to the point where he gets the mask. It's kind of similar uh, how he acquires it in the book, but everything else is so different. <laughs> it's almost unrecognizable to the book. In the episode, Carly Beth is almost treated like her own main character as well, so you get a dynamic form of storytelling. There's a brand new character introduced, like a villain. Um, the shopkeeper uh, puts on Carly Beth's mask from the former Halloween and becomes its own side villain of the story, if not the main villain, while Steve is going through his turmoil in his, in his old man mask. And even down to Chuck, Sabrina, and their inclusion in the story is not in the book. Uh, the themes and messages that you get from this version is not in the book. In the book, uh, it's more about Steve's, uh, you know, turning old, stuck in, his, stuck in his house. He's trying to leave to get caught up to the trick-or-treaters, and he's a little too slow, and then he starts to panic and wants the mask off. Carly Beth takes him back to the rundown shop. They find a suit. The, the suit magically pulls the mask off of his face. None of that stuff happens in this episode whatsoever. So, yeah, it's basically in name only, but there's enough similarities there that kind of tie it to the book, but it's very loose, so it's deserving at number four here. All right, now we're in the top three, and these are pretty much the golden childs <laughs> for this topic here. Uh, at number three, now, like I brought up earlier, some people might be upset that I didn't include more Monster Blood, but I'm including this. And the reason why I'm including this is because of the title. Uh, and it's Deep Trouble, which is a two-parter from season four. If you're not a well-versed book fan and you've only seen the episodes, you wouldn't know this, but... This episode essentially frankenstein an original story idea to fit their budget restraints. They took Deep Trouble 1's first book and Deep Trouble 2's book, and they merged it all together into one hodgepodge, unrecognizable thing, and it's almost like its own story. Uh, so, without getting into too much detail, the first book is about Billy Deep being the main character, He's out on a boat in the Caribbean with his sister Sheena and his uncle, uh, Dr. Deep. He is out diving, uh, and he one day encounters a mermaid. And the whole book is about him saving a mermaid from his uncle's uh, lab assistant who wants to take the mermaid and pretty much sell it off to science and become rich. In the second book, Billy Deep is still the main character. Uh, he's back with his uncle again in the Caribbean. And there's another character named Dr. Ritter, who's also working with Dr. Deep. But this time there is a new uh, particle that's being pretty much put into animal, the, the food chain in the water. And it's coming to talk about like pollution and, uh, you know, the environment and stuff like that. And Dr. Ritter wants the formula to essentially 
uh, make money off of because it could be a, a, a game-changing form of food, uh, making essentially specimens huge. This has a similar idea to Deep Trouble 2, but it's pretty much unrecognizable. The episode takes place on an island that never actually happened in either of the books, and um, Sheena's more the main character here. Sheena gets more of the narrative while Billy's put on the back burner. And the plots are kind of Frankenstein. Uh, Dr. Ritter is more treated like the, the character we saw in Deep Trouble 1's book. Uh, the plot with the, the animal food that, you know, the animals can ingest is kind of touched on here, but it's done in a different way because there's human experimentation and all that and turning people into giant fish <laughs> uh, that's unrecognizable. There's a whole part of the story where they're exiled on this other island where they put pawned off these giant animals and there's fish people underground trying to plot revenge on Dr. Ritter. That never happened in the book and the, and the ending is also different as well. So yeah, Deep Trouble 2's episode, it earns its spot in the top three. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a hodgepodge of different things going on um, and it's pretty much its own Elseworlds, I think, compared to the two books. So there you go. Now, my top two, uh, these are actually short story adaptations. Uh, some people might be upset that I put short story adaptations, but I think it do, I think it, they do count here. And on number two, we have Teacher's Pet, which is included on this Headless Ghost DVD, which also includes Awesome Ants and the Teacher's Pet episode as well. Um, Teacher's Pet is almost in name only. Uh, the short story that it comes from comes from the first Tales to Give You Goosebumps book. And in the first book, the story's about these two kids, um, Becca and her friend, I forget the guy's name. They are pretty much new students in this brand new teacher's classroom one year, uh, I guess in their seventh grade year or something, maybe sixth grade. Uh, but their teacher's like obsessed with snakes and has these, you know, snake terrariums all over his classroom. And they decide to get some revenge on him. Uh, or, you know, spy around on them one day and discover there's a giant snake in there, but there's some realizations about what the snake is, and it may or may not be their teacher, and we get to see what happens to them, right? Moving forward. The episode is almost unrecognizable because the whole thing takes place in the woods, and off the bat, the teacher, or I should say teacher of the story, Mr. Blankenship, it's not even their actual school teacher. He's kind of like a field guide. Uh, showing around nature and these kids are like on like a, I guess a field trip or something and they come across this random shack that has all these uh, uh, you know snake skins hanging around and maybe some terrariums in there but they don't know what to make of it and uh, they seem to think that there's something really weird going on because there's animals <laughs> with like like snake heads on a rabbit and stuff like that in the episode that they're, they're trying to pinpoint exactly what the origin is. There might be some air, animal experimentation going on. And then they find out the realization with Mr. Blankenship. And there's a whole different thing that happens with Mr. Blankenship's character. A completely different climax and a completely different ending. And if you've seen the ending, you know about the atrocities that are going to be seen by your eyes there. <laughs> so... Yeah, Teacher's Pet, almost unrecognizable. I will say, though, there is some similarities about uncovering, uh, I guess, a teacher figure's obsession with, like, snakes and wildlife. Uh, but, and, and I guess the teacher actually being possibly associated with those creatures. There is some similarities there, but that's as far as they go. It's pretty much in name only, and they took the concept. They even add, uh, added new characters into the mix to kind of shake it up. Um, and these new characters are not in the short story, so there you go. Teacher's Pet, number two. It's definitely, you know, one of the most distinct, distinctfully unrecognizable ones. But now it is number one. N number one is the most in-name only episode of the whole show. Uh, and it comes to no surprise for a lot of you, especially if you're a well-versed reader and viewer of the show. It goes to The Haunted House Game. The Haunted House Game is 100% in name only. The only thing similar <laughs> to the short story that was featured in Tales to Give You Goosebumps book three, or even the original contest version that was in Totally Fox Kids magazine, is the fact that there's two characters named Nadine and Jonathan. Everything else is different. 
<laughs> down to the concept, how the story unfolds, what happens in the story. Uh, the mechanisms within within the context of this being a board game story is completely different. There's brand new characters, brand new set pieces. Everything is not recognizable to the short story. The short story actually has like three or four characters, and it's a rainy day. They pull out this game they always play called the Haunted House game. And when they play it, weird things start to match inside the house they're in, like creaking up the floor, floorboards or tapping on the windows and stuff like that. And it comes to like this Twilight Zone revelation near the end where the kids kind of realize the, the, the reality of their situation and uh, how they're going to move forward with that. As in the episode here, it's about Nadine and Jonathan. They stumble across a girl who's crying outside of this old house that looks decrepit and unlived in. She said her cat disappears and disappeared inside and then she needs the cat to be rescued. They step up to the plate. They go inside. They stumble across a board game called the, uh, the Mansion of Terror game or something like that. They get warped inside the board game, and they have to play by rolling dice and going into various levels to collect items to get them out of the game. That's essentially this. I mean, it's totally unrecognizable to the source material down to the point where it's almost in-name only. You could have named this episode, like the title on this DVD, Scary House, and people would have bought that it's its own original story, Maybe they could have made the connections that Jonathan and Nadine share the same names to the characters in the Haunted House game, but all you have to do there is just change their names. They could have made this an in-name only story. I don't know why they did it this way, but it looks like this one was the, the most liberties the showrunners ever took in terms of taking, a, I guess, a title of a story and saying, we're going to throw this out the window and make something completely new out of it. So there you go. So yeah. Those are my my list. It doesn't have to be yours, but this is my list of the top 10 most unrecognizable, uh, or I guess unfaithful, uh, Goosebumps episode adaptations from the 90s show. Like I said early on in the video, let me know down in the comment section uh, if you have any other episodes that you would put on the list. What would your list look like? Uh, what do you think is the most faithful, or I guess most unfaithful <laughs> if you want to put the most faithful too that could be another uh sister topic that we can do associated with this video uh, i do have a few in mind for that so stay tuned for that in the future uh, but until next time have a good one and take care